What up, what up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Ask Paul. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host for this podcast series. Thanks for joining me. Again, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to this podcast, whether you're cruising down the road, sitting on the job site, uh, sharing with other people at your job site, uh, or maybe you're just doing like I do, listen on my Alexa device when I'm taking a shower or getting ready for bed. And uh, again, we're available on the Alexa device. All you got to do is ask it for a National Electrical Code podcast and will pop up on your device. Um, but of course, I use Spotify and the app and stream it to my Alexa devices. And uh, there's so many ways to listen to the podcast. And all you got to do is go out there and Google Master the NEC podcast or Let's Ask Paul podcast. Uh, you can go to our, our website and you can actually uh, listen to a podcast there if you're a member. Um, but if you want to listen to all of these Let's Ask Paul, you can just go to paulabernathy.com. And there's a player there. You can listen to all the podcasts there if you want. Stream them through your phone, play them through your external speaker, or whatever you want to do. But we do thank you for taking the time and listening to these podcasts and sharing them. Again, we're, the, uh, we're just uh, so blessed to be able to offer these and be able to get this information out to you. On today's episode of, and this is how it works, uh, folks like you have pressing questions on the National Electrical Code. And what you'll do is you'll go over to Paul Abernathy. Dot com and it's just a quick easy simple format there your name and everything and and just basically put in your question and click the submit button it will come to me it will be dumped in a special folder that I go to I get so many emails that this is the way that I'm able to manage everybody asks me how do I do all the little things that I do in a day uh, from the videos the podcast to the consulting to the training to working for encore it's because I have things set up to put things where they need to be so that I can be very organized in how I address them. So I have a folder set up specifically for Let's Ask Paul. It dumps all of those in there. That's why it's easier for me to answer those questions than it is random emails because they could get lost in the hundreds and hundreds of emails I get a week. So it's just an easy way for me to manage the amount of emails that come in. And of course, our Fast Tracks program now has uh, thousands of students in it and uh, you know, a lot of them I interact with. A lot of them come to the Wednesday nights. Many of them uh, will have private sessions that are through the corporations that have a block of corporate accounts with us. And so there's so many things we have going on that the easiest way to get an answer f or help from me is using that Let's Ask Paul process over on paulabernathy.com. So if you got a question, that's the that's the real place that really focuses on me being able to answer those questions. And that's why we're here today. For this podcast is we're going to answer questions. So the uh, first question that was submitted to me was, Paul, can you quickly and easily, boy, that's a stretch for me, isn't it? Can you quickly and easily explain the parts of doing a standard method, single family dwelling calculation? Thanks in advance. Okay, so I will try to keep it as quick because I do have a coffee hour on that. So if you haven't listened to that or seen it, and again, it's very visual. So if you're listening to this podcast, take a moment and think, well, you know what, if I have some spare time and I want to dedicate it to a video, go over to our YouTube channel. Again, it's youtube.com forward slash master the NEC, all one word, M-A-S-T-E-R-T-H-E-N-E-C. Go over there, bookmark it, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And every time we come up with something it, uh, you'll be notified and you can choose to watch it or not. You can always dismiss. However, if it's something that doesn't pique your interest, then just ignore it. You know what I'm saying? But we will have a lot of, we have a lot of content and we're playing a lot of the old programs that we have done that are still relevant through the past couple years with our Electrician Live series, which, which morphed into Electrify, uh, which is now morphed into Coffee Hour. Um, so, you know, that's the best place to get all the reoccurring content. Of course, you could also go over to electricianlive.com, and that is our broadcast network where you can get access to all the shows from there as well. So whatever your flavor, uh, that's what you can choose. All right, so I'm going to answer this question. So I like to tell people that it, it's broken down into many parts. The standard method is different, obviously, than the optional method because you get to apply different demand factors along the journey of calculating the dwelling. Whereas in the optional method, which is perfectly okay to do, uh, now if you're on an exam, it'll tell you, you always assume standard unless they say optional. In the real world, we're going to use optional. 
Remembering that for neutral calculations, we're always going to ultimately do the standards. So this is why I tell people when, when they say that you'll never use the standard method, that's not actually true. You need to know how to do it. And as a professional in this business, you need to know how to do the standard method. Even if you do the standard and you're off a little bit, you're going to be generally okay because the option method is always going to be resulting in a less value. So standard is always going to probably be more. When I say more, probably result in more amps than what you would get uh, for the optional method. In the real world, most people use the optional method, but I'm very conscious of the fact that on exams, they like to focus on the standard method. So that's why we teach both methods. And that's why this person is asking that they want to know the steps. Now, I'm not going to go so digging deep into the weeds because we have a video on that. Just go over and look for our coffee hour for single family dwellings and you can find it. But I'm going to kind of talk about the steps. So step one, when we're determining a single family dwelling calculation, we have to know this, the floor area that we're working with. So in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code, you're going to see 220.11. That is titled floor area. Now, in the 2017 code, that was in 220.12, but that's since been broken up in the 2020. That way, 220.12 is specifically for non-dwelling occupancies. And so when we're dealing with a dwelling, we know that we're going to use 220.11 generally, Okay, for floor area calculations for dimensions. But once we get that floor area, length times the width, once we get that value, then we're going to immediately jump in the first stage and we're going to go to 220.14J. That's entitled, uh, or titled, I should say, dwelling unit. All right. Now, in there, it's going to tell us to take 3VA per square foot, right? So it's 3VA per square foot. You're going to have to calculate the square footage using 220.11 and the instructions that it says. Okay, length times width is going to give you your square footage. Remembering now that if you have a two-story home and the basement's an unfinished basement, that is adaptable for future use. You're going to need to count that square footage. Why? Because if somebody finishes it later down the road and puts general use receptacles in there, they don't have to add any additional VA, volt amperes to the calc, because it's already been considered in your original calculation, right? So keep that in mind. So we've, we've determined our square footage area. We have determined that we do not include the area for open porches, garages, or unused or unfinished spaces that are not adaptable for future use. So if you have a pull down for an attic, that's still not adaptable for future use. If you have set stairs and a stairwell that goes up and the ceiling is in the floor of the attic space is designed to support load, then that could be adaptable for future use. You need to take it into consideration. But if it's just rafters and it's just a pull down access to it and things like that, then it wouldn't be adaptable. But an unfinished basement is most certainly adaptable for future use. So you need to take that square footage into consideration, right? So that's all covered in 220.11. Ultimately, in 220.14J, we know that dwelling units, it's telling us that one family dwelling, two family dwellings, and multifamily dwellings, that's the individual dwelling units of a multifamily building, it says the minimum load shall be not less than 3 VA or volt amperes per square foot, right? It says the lighting and receptacle outlet specified in 220.14J1, uh, J excuse me, J2, and J3, okay, are included in this minimum unit load. So J1, J2, J3, you'll notice it is all of the general use receptacles in your dwelling, okay, and that's the 20 amps rated or less. That's the general use. We're not talking small appliance. That we got to account for in a minute. But all the general use receptacles all get counted in there. Now, you'll notice something. There is no 180 VA per strap like you get in commercial. It's not how we do it here. That's not how you do it for dwellings, okay? All right, so it tells us that no additional load calculations shall be required for such outlets. And that's why you have a one, two, and a three below. All of this, the general lighting, the lighting in the rooms, uh, things like all of that is already figured in, Okay. Now, uh, and again, we're just, we're, we're just kind of trying to give the steps here a little bit. Uh, so the lighting in all of them that are listed in 210.70 are figured into this. All of the general receptacles that are required for your spacing in 210.52A, that's all figured into this. Um, but what about the small appliance brand circuits? Okay, well, the code says you have to have a minimum of two, right? Where do we get that information at? Well, 210.11C is, is going to say that you have to have at least two 20 amp small appliance brand circuits, right? So we have to have at least two of those. And where do you get the VA for that? Well, that's in 220.52A, and that tells us small appliance circuit loads is 1500 VA 
for each small appliance. And you have to have a minimum of two. Okay, so 210.11c gave us that direction. So that's 1,500 each, right? So two, that's 3,000. Next would be 220.52b, which is the laundry circuit. And that's telling you to have to have at least one. And we get that also from 210.11c. They have to have at least one. And we're talking single family dwelling now. So we're not looking at any of the exceptions if you have a multifamily building with a laundry facility on site and all those. We're not doing that. Okay. So there's so many people out there that want to, that have the ADHD. They, they want to wander off of what we're talking about. Stick with the single family dwelling. That's what the question was to me. All right. So at least one laundry, and that's 1500 VA, that gives it to you right there as well in 220.52B. Okay, so, so far we've got three VA per square foot. Okay, so we take whatever that was. If it was, I don't know, 2,000 square foot, 2,000 times three, that's 6,000 plus 3,000 for the two small appliances and then 1,500 for the laundry. Okay, now keep in mind in the real world now, if you happen to have four small appliance brand circuits, you have to account for them. So this is a minimum of two, but you could have more. So don't lose sight of the fact that if I have four small appliance brand circuits, that's 1500 each. Okay. And we're doing VA. Okay. We're working VA out. All right. Same with the laundry. If you have more than one, you have to account for them. Now, remember the dryer is not the laundry circuit. That is already, that's going to be covered as well in 220.54. So don't intermix the two. We're doing general use and general lighting uh, uh, loads here, and we're trying to add the other components in there so that we can apply a demand factor, okay? All right. So let's kind of take a deep breath and get back where we're at. So we did our square footage. We got our 3VA per square foot. We added our small appliances, and we added our laundry. We got all that. Now, one of the beautiful things that we can do now with this is we get what's called a demand factor that we get to apply in 220.42. So if you go look at 220.42, it says general lighting. Now, the, one of the things that people lose sight or can't wrap their mind around is, Paul, it says general lighting, general lighting. Why are you adding the receptacles in there? Because we got that allowance from 220.14J, remember? It's already in there. Just because... Just because 220.42 says general lighting, you have to understand that that is general lighting and general receptacle use. Could they have changed the title to that and make it even clearer? Yeah, but again, the NEC is not considered for somebody that's untrained. So you should know that. So that's where we're at, okay? So when we look at 220.42, and we're not looking at a table yet, we're looking at the actual code language. It says the demand factor specified in table 220.42 shall apply to that portion of the total branch circuit load calculated for general illumination. They shall not be applied to determining the number of branch circuits for general illumination. Okay, so you're not using this to divide it by the brain, the breaker rating to determine how many lights you need. That's determined by the code, depending on the room where you're at and you had in your lighting, and then you do normal Watts law to determine how many you can put on a circuit because lighting is a defined value, whatever the rating is of the luminaire. Receptacles, there is no limit. You could put 50 on a brand circuit if you want. It's not practical. People don't do it. Uh, people have rule of thumbs. But the reality is, again, you're not using 180 VA for dwellings. That's commercial work. So while some people might use that to come up with their rule of thumb, that is not what the code says at this stage. Okay. All right. So we're going to, we would apply the general. So that takes us to table 220.42. Remember, we just did the small appliances and the laundry and the three VA per square foot. We, that's the only part so far we've done. Here it tells you for dwelling units, you take the first 3,000 of that total. So you're going to add, in our case, we said it was what? Just for craps and giggles. We said it was 2,000 square feet. So we did 2,000 times three. That was 6,000. Plus we had a minimum of two small appliance circuits. So that's plus another 3,000. Where did we get that? because each one is 1,500, right? Okay. Plus, we have one laundry, which is 1,500. So we have a total of 10,500. So what this says here, we get to apply our first demand factor. And it says the first 3,000, you take at 100%. So here's what I tell people. Of that 10,500, subtract 3,000 away from that so we can continue on with the math. But that 3,000 that you took at 100% and you set it aside you're going to add that back later, okay? Because that was 100%. You're supposed to take 3,000 at 100%. So I'm going to take that 10,500 minus 3,000. 
and that gives me 7,500. Now, from that 3,001, because remember, we set the 3,000 aside at 100%, from 3,001 up to 120,000, or as some educators like to say, the next 117,000, because 117 plus 3,000 is 120. So the next portion, in our case, we're nowhere near over 120,000, so it's not a big deal. We have 7,500 remaining. Okay, so remember, you took that 10.5 minus 3, that left us at 7.5. I'm going to take this at 35%. So that's 7,500 times 35%. That equals 2,625. Okay, let me redo that. Okay, so that 2,625, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to now add that 3,000 that we took at 100%. I'm going to add it back. So it's plus 3,000. So we have 5,000. 625 VA, that is our general light and general use receptacle loads after demand factors have been applied. So before the demand factors were applied, that was the connected load. After the demand factors were applied, that is the calculated load. Okay, so that's the first step, done. Okay, now we put that aside and we move on to the next step. So logically, the next thing we move on to is appliances. So you have to look at all your appliances in your house. Okay, appliances have a definition of what appliances are. We're talking things like dishwasher, garbage disposal, even though that's probably going to be rated in horsepower, so that is a motor, whereas a dishwasher you typically don't take as a motor because it has multiple functions. It usually has heating in it, and it usually has a motor load in it, but it doesn't give it in horsepower ratings like you would for a motor. So when we're doing later the largest motor, we typically don't use dishwashers, but we will use like a disposer because it comes in a horsepower rating. Um, in the real world, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Uh, it's not a huge amount because you're only going to capture that additional 25%. But on an exam, they're usually going to give you everything that you need to go and work with. So it should be pretty evident where your largest motor is. But I just want to keep you, you know, aware of all that as you move through this. Okay, so appliances. So the next thing we'll look at, the logical flow is 220.53. And this tells me for dwelling units now, and again, this only applies to dwelling units. It says it shall be permissible to apply demand factor of 75% to the nameplate rating of four or more appliances. So if I have three or less, then I have to just, as my appliance contribution, I would just take the full nameplate and put it in. Remembering now, if it gives me a value, I have to convert to VA. Okay, I need to work VA out. So if it gives me an amp value and I have a, a voltage value, then I'm on a volts times amps, and that's going to give me my watts, which is synonymous with VA. So that's the value. That's how we work that out, depending on what they give you, right? Okay. And, and we cover all this in our Fast Tracks program in case that sounds confusing for you. But um, so if I have four or more appliances, then I get to add all of their nameplates up, and then I get to apply 75% demand factor. And once I do that, let's say I had a water heater, let's say I had the uh, disposal, dishwasher, trash compactor. That's four or more, okay? So I'm adding them all up and I get to apply 75% to that and that's the next step in our contribution. That's the part that we add, okay? All right, so after we've done the appliance, the next logical step would be to move on to let's get rid of the clothes dryer. So again, we're doing standard method. So the clothes dryer is under 220.54. Now, what you'll notice in here, it says that you're going to use 5,000 watts, which is synonymous with VA, uh, and it tells you that right in the requirement in 220.54, that you're going to take that at 5,000 VA, okay? Uh, if it's smaller than that, you're still going to use 5,000. However, if your dryer is larger than 5,000, then you're going to take whatever the nameplate is, okay? Whichever is larger is what you're gonna do, okay? So in this situation, I didn't give you a size, but if it was a 4,000, uh, uh, a 4 a kVA uh, dryer or 4 kW dryer, then you're gonna use 5,000 for that, right? So that's 5,000, so you just put that down. That's that next step. Uh, if it had been a uh, 5,500 or 55.5 kW, then you're going to use 5,500 VA. Again, watts is synonymous with VA. I like to move everything ultimately into VA, okay? So you, you get the point. That's what you do for the standard method. And it's pretty simple. You just write that value down. The next step is your cooking. 
Now, one thing to remember, like with a dryer, that is not a requirement of the code. So be careful if you're doing exam prep or the person that's listening that asked the question. Um, if they don't give you a dryer, don't assume one. If they give you a dryer, account for one. You with me? Um, same thing with cooking. Now, they'll give you cooking. Cooking is not a requirement in the code to have. But if they give you that information, then you're going to use it. Remember, you can't assume something that you don't know the value and there's so many different var variables involved that you can't just assume anything. We can easily assume a minimum of two small appliance brand circuits because they tell us we have to have at least two. And they give us the VA for that. Same with the laundry. They don't do that with dryers and they don't do that with cooking if it's not available. If it is available, it is there, then you can take it into consideration. All right, so for cooking... Let's read what it says. It says the load for household electric ranges, wall-mounted ovens, counter-mounted cooking units, and other household cooking appliances individually rated in excess of one and three quarter shall be permitted to be calculated in accordance with table 220.55. Remembering if it what? If it's not in excess of one and three quarter, this is going to take the value itself as an appliance and you take the full nameplate value and add it. Okay, That's kind of what we do in 220.14a. So we're taking that a value, whatever, can, whatever the load would be. But most of this cooking is going to be over one and three quarter anyway. So we're able to use table 220.55. Say, and it reminds us again, the kilovolts KVA shall be considered equivalent to kilowatts KW for load calculations under this section. Okay, under section 54, excuse me, 55 of cooking. All right, so we're going to go real quick and look at the table. So here's the table. The table is broken down into three columns, okay, with four columns, but three have to do with, uh, two of them have to do with demand factor percentages. That's column A and column B. And then column C is a actual demand value. So the difference in it is the demand, the percentages are A and B. That is not a percentage under column C. That's an actual KW value. So when you read the table at the very top, You'll notice that it gives you the information about demand factors and it's kind of what we just read. But also in parentheses, it says column C is to be used in all cases except otherwise permitted in note three. So when you're doing the calculation, let's say for a single family dwelling, if they tell you that it's a 12 kW range, then when you're applying the maximum demand for that, you go to column C and you'll see that for one range, that it is 8 kW. It doesn't matter that the range is 12 kW. And the calculation, again, this is a demand factor. This is taking things into consideration. I'm allowed to put 8,000 on my calculation, okay? Now, if you wanna take the full 12, go for it. It's just gonna be a bigger service. But we're always trying to solve for the best possible answer here. So 8 kW is gonna be what the answer would be. Now, in the off case that you get something where it has two ovens and a cooktop, and they say they fall between column A and column B, then what you get to do is you get to use, just like it said in the parentheses, I get to use note three. And note three tells me if the cooking appliances that I'm using fall between over one and three quarter through eight and three quarter, which may be what happens if you get like a, a cooktop that's 6,000, uh, watts, and you might get two ovens that are 3,000, okay? They both fall within column A and column B. So you're going to take the two ovens, and since it's two of them, they fall under column A. You're going to go to the number of appliances, go down to two. You're going to add those two together, which is three and three is six. Two of them, you get to apply 75% demand factor, and you write that down. Then you jump over to the cooktop. The cooktop was six. Well, that falls under column B. Well, for one appliance, because again, it's just one cooktop, you see that there's an 80% demand factor that you can apply. Okay, so I'm take that 6,000 and I'm gonna do that at 80%. And that's gonna be my demand factor, right? So that's gonna be 4,800. Okay, so you take that and you add it to the results of column A, you add the two together, and whatever that is as far as VA, if that is less than what you would get in column C, which column C is you take all three appliances and you move it to the right and you'll see that that is 14 kW. All right, well, I'm gonna use the value of the sum of column A and column B added together like we just did because that is gonna be less than 14. 
And the code allows you to do that. I can choose whichever is the lesser. Now that is unique in the code because most other places like heat versus AC, for example, that we'll, co- we'll talk about, you take the larger. But when it comes to this, you're taking the s- whatever results in the smaller, okay? All right, so again, be familiar with all the notes here. Most of the time for single family dwellings, you're not going to deal much in note one and note two. You're going to be mainly in note three. Um, also, just a reminder that for branch circuit sizing that you're running, let's say, a single branch circuit where you have the ability to tap off in 210, uh, be aware that note four is for branch circuit loading, which just tells you what to do, gives you permission. You're still going to use the values from this table, but that is for branch circuit. When we're doing a full service or feeder load calc, then you're probably more often than not going to be in note three if, if you've got a separate cooktops and separate ovens and things like that. If you just have a standard range, uh, then you're just going to, more often than not, with that, you're just going to be in column C. Okay. All right. Okay. So that's how you do your ranges. Take that value. You write that down. And if you want to know more about ranges and you want to know all the nuances about ranges, how to use all these notes, which are all applicable, by the way, um, then I encourage you to get in our monthly subscription program. And I have videos on range calculations. They're only available to monthly subscribers or annual subscribers. Uh, you, if you only want to come for one month and get what you need and leave, that's up to you. If you support what we do and you think that uh, $120 or less a year is a small price to pay to support all the education we do, then you keep renewing it. That is totally your choice. I don't care either way. Uh, but that is a subscription program that's available on our website over at electricalcodeacademy.net. At the top, you'll see subscription button. Follow the rules, set your account up, and you can uh, continue to follow us every month. And we'll put in there. Uh, also, I should say you get access to the Wednesday nights if you become a, a monthly subscriber. So you can join us on Wednesday nights, whether you're exam prepping or not. You just want to be a fly on the wall and learn a little bit. You can join us. You get also access to all the rebroadcasts of our Wednesday night sessions. Okay, so that's just a perk for those that are uh, not fast track students, but want to get involved in it and just elevate their game a little bit. It's included in there. So and of course, also any webinars we do like the grounding and bonding one I did, 12-hour series, that's available only to members. So that's in the member area only. And of course, our swimming pools, spas, and hot tub long series that I did with Vince Delacroix, that is also available up there. That's worth the price of admission alone for that. So, so much in there for members only. We don't share generally on uh, the internet anymore or YouTube all of our lessons. We have a lot of promo stuff, but not our full in-depth lessons. So if you want that, check it out. All right. Okay. So after we've done the range, okay, we're moving on and now we're going to do the heat and air conditioning. So here's the thing in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code, heat and air conditioning, you're going to be moving into 220.60 at this point. And what the code is telling you here is that you have to look at the heat and you have to look at the air conditioning. Whichever is larger, that's what you're going to take on your, as your contribution. But in the 2020 code, there was a slight change because in the 2017, you compared heat at 100%. You compared uh, the uh, AC at 100%. And whichever was larger, that's what you took. And you discounted the lesser. Now, people say, why would you do that? Well, obviously, if I size it based on the larger, at the portion of the year when it's using the lesser, it's not nearly as much as the larger. So it's not a big deal. So you're always sizing for the worst case scenario. So that's why it's that way. Now, in the 2020 edition of the NEC, um, you have to do that calculation. Again, you do the AC versus heat. And if the heat is larger than the AC, but the AC happens to have the largest motor in the dwelling, and usually it will, okay, it'll be the air air condenser motor. And uh, if that is the AC condenser motor, if that is the largest motor in the dwelling, then you take that value of that motor and like say a five horsepower motor at 240 or whatever, you take that at 125% plus the sum of the other associated motors and loads that will be on at the same time. So let's say you had air conditioning outside, air conditioning unit with a com- con- uh, an AC compressor, uh, or maybe it's a condenser. I'm not an AC guy, but you got it. You take that at 125% and then you have a fan motor and then you also have an air handler. Take those two things at 100%, add them all together and compare it to the heat. If heat is still greater, then you take the, uh, you still get the heat, okay? If you do that and the AC ends up being greater than the heat, then you have to take the AC. So the easiest way to do this to even start is to compare heat versus AC. And if heat's larger than AC, 
then how much larger is it? Then you probably can just stop right there and just take the heat. But if the heat is larger and the non-coincident load is less, which is the AC, and that also contains the largest motor in the dwelling, okay, well, if that's the case, then you're going to take the, uh, you're going to compare it and add the 125% to the air conditioning motor plus the other uh, loads and compare the two again. Remembering with the heat, you also want to add the air handler if the air handler is part of that equation. In other words, it blows the heat around. So you want to take the heat plus all associated loads that would be running while the heat's running. So when you're doing this comparison, okay? And that was a change from 2017 where you just take the heat versus AC and let her go, okay? All right. So the, that And so what happens is you take whichever is the larger and boom, there you go. And in a single family dwelling, probably the, the heat... It's probably going to be, be the larger. Now, a, why, a word of wisdom to you, if you have a heat pump system, remember that if you have the ability for the heat and the cooling to be on at the same time, maybe in a defrost mode or whatever, then you got to remember that you're going to basically have to take the heat and the AC because they're not non-coincident loads. They could run together, okay? So just take that into consideration. This only applies where it's you have truly non-coincident loads. Okay. Now, if you want to get some direction on how you may take your loads for that optional method, and most people are going to do an op- you're going to do an optional method anyway for the dwelling, then you can go look at 220.82, and you look at C, it gives you some, some direction here. But other than this, you only get to drop the non-coincident loads if it is truly non-coincident loads. If it is not a non-coincidental load, mean operating at the, uh, means that it can't operate at the same time, then you have to account for that load. Or you have to account for that portion of the load that will operate at the same time as the other loads. Okay? So just remember that if you're dealing with AC versus heat, and we use that, it doesn't just apply to that, though, by the way. Um, you could be in a commercial building. You could have non-coincident loads. You can be in an industrial building, have non-coincident loads. means two loads that aren't going to operate at the same time. Uh, maybe due to thermostatically control or some type of interlock that keeps the two, then you get to take the larger of the two. And when you're sizing, that's a beautiful thing. When it comes to residential, typically we use heat versus AC, uh, and it's usually thermostatically controlled, so heat can't come on when the AC's on. But if if it's not set up that way, then you have to take all your loads into consideration because if two of them, if both of them can be running at the same time, then you have to account for that load. Okay, so hopefully I explain that to you. All right, if I confused you, make sure you go watch our video that we have on single family dwellings and I explain it much easier than that. And if you're somebody that didn't like that or said you could do a better job, I eagerly await your podcast because talk is cheap. Put out some content and stop being a stop being a hater. All right, so after that, the last thing you want to do is look at the largest motor. Now, this is the one that typically confuses a lot of people because they'll look at this and go, all right, what is the largest motor? How do I account for this, this largest motor, right? And so when you look at it, what we're really looking at is 220.50. Now, 220.50 says motor loads shall be calculated in accordance with 430.24, 430.25, 430.26, and 440.6 uh, for hermetic refrigerant motor compressors. And I guess that's what we were talking about outside that compressor. Um, typically, that would be the largest load in your building, right? Now, the thing about that is when you're doing AC versus heat, if ultimately the AC is discarded and you you end up using the heat, right? Then at the end of the day, um, what we want to remember is that we have to then go searching for the largest motor. And in most cases, it's going to be the disposal. Now, remember, you're only trying to capture the 25%. Now, where do we get that from? Well, if you look at 430.24, 430.25, 430.26, 440.6. All we're trying to do is take the motor at 125%. Well, since we've already accounted for all of the appliances, we only need to capture that additional 25%. So it doesn't say it here, but that's what it means. That's the intent of it. Again, people say, I don't like that, that concept. I want it to be clearer. But at the end of the day, that, I mean, that's all we have. And I'm trying to give you, and this is not something that I'm making up. This is something that's traditionally, whether you look at any educator out there, this is how we teach it. So, um, again, 
Code panels are eagerly await your public input on how to make this even clearer. But if you dig into the weeds, you will see that that motor application on 220.50 is trying to capture the largest motor. Now, we've already accounted for all of them in our calculation. So it stands to reason that we only need to capture that additional 25% because we already captured the value of the motor already in our calculation. Okay. So in this case, we're looking for the largest motor. Now, again, if heat versus AC is discounted the AC, then we're going to find what the other largest motor in there is because we have already accounted for the fact that the heat is greater when the heat is running or the AC is running, it's not greater than the heat. So that's already taken care of. So we're just searching for the next largest motor. In this case, to say it's the disposal. So you take whatever the VA is a disposer times uh, 0.25. We want to get 25% and you add that to your calculation. And that is your 25% contribution for the largest motor. So in theory, you're taking it really, you're getting 125% of it, even though we may have demand factors that have been applied to appliances, we're still going to capture, we're still capturing that load. All we're trying to do is hunt for that additional 25%. Now in the scheme of life to the person that asked the question, uh, is that 25% going to probably make a difference? Probably not. And it's probably not going to change your overall calculation. I say probably not because <laughs> some people might write an exam or something so that that is the difference between one size to another or something like that. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Okay, so once you have all those values, you simply add them all up, right? And then you just simply do what? You divide that by 240, and that is your VA. Then once you have that VA, again, remember now, if it's 0.5 or greater, you round up. If it's 0.4 or less, you can drop it. Then the next thing you need to do, go is to 240.6A and see what size overcurrent device do I need to protect for that size, Okay. So in our case, let's just throw a number. Let's say it was calculated load after we did everything was 165. So we're going to go to 240.6. And we're going to look at the overcurrent protection device sizing. And we have a nifty little table there is 240.6A. And we is 165, falls between 150 and 175. Okay, so at that point, the code allows us to say we're, this is a 175 amp rated service. Okay, now... Conductor sizing. Could you size those conductors for that 175? Absolutely. You go to 310.16, size it. However, we do have allowances in what's called 310.12. And this is where a lot of people forget that if my service is a 122.40, and we'll stick with that rather than talking about 122.08 for individual dwelling units. If we're talking 122.40 and the, the voltage, I mean, the, um, the amp range rating is between 100 and 400, then I'm going to be able to use 310.12. And as long as the panel we're talking about the service, everything handles 100% of the load, means I'm going straight from the service head, straight down to the meter, and straight into the service disconnect, uh, whether it's in 2020 code, it'd be an exterior, which is also the emergency disconnect. Uh, but you have other options where it doesn't have to be the service disconnect. But then let's just say by the time it comes to the service equipment and terminates in that service equipment, that panel handles 100% of the load, or that conductor is going to see 100% of the load. If that's the case, the code says that those service conductors have to be, or can be, or permitted to be, 83% of the service rating. So if I have 175 amps, that's the rating of the, of the, circ, of the actual service at this point, and I'm going to do that times 0.83, that's 145.25. So now I have to size a conductor that's going to give me at least 145.25 amps, and it's going to be based on the 75 degrees C column. Why 75 degrees C? Because if all we know, and we don't know the conductor sizes, so, I mean, the types, but what we do know is that it's over 100 amps. So 110.14 C1 is telling me that I'm going to use 75. Okay, always be conscious of your terminal limitations, right? So in this case, I would go to 310.16, and I'm going to size a conductor. And I'm going to be under 75, and I need a conductor that can handle 145.25 amps. Well, in this case, it looks like it's a one aught. We're under 75. Again, assume copper. Don't ever assume aluminum unless they state aluminum. So it's 150 amps is good. So can I have a 150 amp rated conductor on a 175 amp rated circuit? Absolutely, I can. Okay, based on this. So this allows me. So this is for the minimum. Okay, minimum of 83% of the rating is the conductor sizing. 
Okay. So that's how we would size it. Now, if you want to size it full size for that, that would just pop it up to a two aught and you're good to go. Now, the other thing I'll remind you is that in 310.12, there is a table. Uh, that table appears back when you get into 2020 code. It wasn't there in the 2017, although it was back in the informative annex D for one of the examples. Prior to that, it was in here, but it was just the 83%. So I prefer you to learn to do the 83% of whatever the service or feeder rating is, and that would be whatever the breaker is that you ultimately end at. Here you can see, for example, the 175 would allow a one ot just like what we just did, okay? Now remember, this is if no conditions of use are applicable. It means that there's not more than three current current conductors, and the ambient temperature is not less or more than 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I know most people don't do that outside. They don't take those things into consideration. They never do. They should, but they never do because they, they argue they don't know what the ambient is, although you can get this information uh, available historically from, your, from ASHRAE or from other uh, documents. Historically, you can look at the temperatures and, and, and look for the hottest months of the year, and you can come up with that, but most inspectors aren't going to do that. And most electricians aren't going to do that. So at the end of the day, um, you just pull straight from this table. But I wanted you to understand how the 83% works, okay? And that's a at least 83%. So if you did have an ambient temperature, then since we're dealing in 75 degrees C and everything's 75 and we didn't know otherwise, then we would go to 31015B1. And when we went to that table, we're going to be looking at the temperature that we're going to be experiencing in that location. Let's say it was 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, well, that is obviously greater Okay, then what we would deal with uh, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, obviously higher. So you go down to the list in uh, 310.15b1, and you'll see that between 114 and 122, you come to the left, it's 0.75 is the actual modifier, okay, the percentage that we're going to use. So I would take, what's the minimum I have to have? I have to have at least 145.25 amps after adjustment and corrections here. It's got to be no less than 83% if I want to use 310.12. So I'm going to take that 145.25 and I'm going to divide it. Remember, division working up. Divide it by 0.75 and that tells me 193.6. So I'm going to go back to my ampacity table. Since I'm stuck in the 75 degree because I didn't tell you that it was THHN, I didn't tell you what type of insulation it was, so I can't use the 90. I still have to stay in the 75. So under the 75, I'm going to come down and I need to find a conductor good for 193.6. Well, it looks like that'd be a 3 aught. Okay, because that's good for 200 amperes. Now, you can verify your math by taking that 200 and then use multiplication and do it by that same modifier, 0.75. And that ends up to be 150. Is 150 greater than 145.25? Absolutely. So it at least still is sized 83% of the service rating, and you're okay. So that's kind of how you would do that. Hopefully I explained that to you um, yeah, a little bit better so you understand it. Be careful of your question. Make sure you read all the pieces. And if you really want to know how to really do this stuff, think about joining the Fast Tracks program. We teach you every little piece. You can come to Wednesday nights and you can ask me questions. If you can, you got, I have some students that will literally ask me questions, email me questions, text me questions. I'm here to help you. That's what we're here for. If you don't understand it, let me explain it to you. That's what you don't get when you buy a book somewhere. You have nobody that explains it to you. That's why I'm here. That's why the fast track system is so important because you get access to somebody that actually helps you. There's a lot of people that talk the talk, but very few walk the walk. They'll sell you a book. They'll sell you a course, but are they there to answer your questions? They're not. In fact, once you become a fast track student, you get access to our fast tracks forum forever. So even though your course might expire, you still get to go in and ask questions. Where else do you get that? Okay. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, about the method. And again, I say quick method and that's 44 minutes into it. But I also felt that it's important to give you details. And that's what we wanted to do in this episode. So hopefully you got something out of that. That's kind of a, 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 a my as quickest version I can other than just giving you little pieces uh, of how you go through a standard calculation for a single family dwelling. Till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless. <laughs>